It was an unassuming thing. I had actually stepped on it, and my sneaker tread left a grimy print upon the envelope. That's how easy it was to miss. Just this small thing on my mat. Something I'd not even seen the first time I passed it. I wished it stayed that way, or somehow found its way down the hall. But as I was leaving my apartment the next morning, I noticed it at last. A plain white envelope, my shoe print on one side. I turned it over towards the sealed part. I saw five words. They were in cursive, in a flowing, billowing script. To whom it may concern. An odd thing, that phrase. But not so odd when I was the eccentric guy in my apartment complex. My neighbours and I never spoke, and the few times that we met, we exchanged nods. I worked a third, twelve-hour shift and slept during the day. They were daywalkers. That's all it was. But it wasn't uncommon for them to reach out. Every fall, I received countless invitations to Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas parties, all of which found their way from my doorstep to the wastebasket. Last year, Mrs. Applegate passed away. I got an invite to her funeral which I didn't attend either. Not going to parties didn't help my reputation, but when you're in the company of strangers, what hold does reputation really have? Especially if you're ignorant to it. I had a few moments before I had to be on my way, so I opened the door to my apartment, set my bag on the counter, and opened the letter. It's been over a year since I read it, but I remember it plain as day. I always will. Even now, I can recall the handwriting, big and loopy, far too beautiful for its horrid subject matter. The contrast between those elements bothered me at first, and terrify me as memories drift into my sleep, making my rest one big nightmare. The letter, more or less, went like this. To whom it may concern. My name is Edias Craddock. I'm an old man now by my own standards and the world's. Being so, I have grown bent and crooked and weak. My vision grows dark and my hands shake, but my mind is still clear. I only wish my conscience was as well. I'm dying, I think. Not of a disease or malady, I've checked, but because of age and a toll on my heart and head. It's a yoke I've drawn for fifty years, head cowed and low, but before I pass, it's time I let it all go. I killed Bob Harlow, my best friend, in 1959 with my bare hands. He was three and thirty, with myself seven years his senior. The police didn't find Bob's body, because there weren't nobody to find. If there's anything left, it's along the coast. Bob liked the coast. Joked all the time it'd be the death of him. That was probably the only honest thing Bob Harlow said. Even with all the lies, even with all the muddled stories and half-truths, I still loved Bob Harlow. The man he was, that man was my brother. As close and as dear as any blood relation. But as I found out, Bob wasn't that man. Not all the time, at least. Rather, I found out what Bob was over time. It bubbled to the surface, black and crude, peeling away the man I once knew. Bob Harlow, as it turns out, had rotted away inside. I don't know how long it was before I met him, but the Bob I met, he was just a thin veneer, a sloppy coat to hide the shambles beneath. I didn't know that when I met him at the beer festival in 1953. Back then, Bob's surface was all I saw. It was all anyone saw. It was all we cared to see. For he was a broad-shouldered, smiling man with a pot belly full of roaring laughter. Bob was the kind of guy who always had a dirty joke you'd enjoy. He'd always had cigars, liquor, and steaks. But no women. Oh, he had callers. But as far as me and anyone else knew, no steady dates. No rolls in the hay, like some men are prone to. 
That was the first strange thing I found about Bob. A few rumors started flying around about Bob being a queer, but Bob just laughed when he heard them. Said he was married to the sea and all that. That was the other strange thing about him. Something no one really thought about. Bob took trips to the coast every weekend, without fail, regardless of what was going on. He said he liked the salt air, the ocean, and the fish, but I never saw him pack a pole. I asked him once why he didn't just move there, but he just smiled and laughed. Bob was strange, real strange, but plenty of people are strange, aren't they? That's what I told myself. It's what I kept telling myself, over and over, right up until Bob invited me to go fishing with him in the summer of 1959. About that time, I'd known Bob for a few years. We played poker together once a week, and he came over for a beer just as much. I'd never been to Bob's house, and he'd never offered. I guess the routine just worked, and we were both fine with it. I wondered afterwards if I'd not have noticed something, had I gone over there. The police certainly did. All the same, I felt comfortable with Bob. So I took him up on the offer. With a packed cooler in the back of his pickup truck, we took off for a sleepy town called Oak Island, in the Carolinas. It packed the gaudy glamour of other beach towns. All the buildings were small and stone, with shutters on every window. It made the whole town seem dour, but Bob kept on smiling, talking and laughing the whole way there. He'd rented a hotel for a few dollars, and we'd arrived so late in the evening, we spent our first day bunking and going to sleep. Bob woke me the next morning, shaking my shoulders until I cursed and spotted. The sun wasn't up and not a single bird sang, but Bob was wide awake, dressed, and had a paper bag in his hands. He told me over sausage biscuits that we were going to his favorite fishing spot. We drove for almost an hour, headlights cutting into the early day. It was still dark when we stopped. I thought we'd see a pier or a wharf, but Bob had parked the car near a shorefront. I told Bob I didn't have any galoshes, but he just smiled and said I'd not need them. It was about that time those rumors about Bob being queer started flickering in my head, but I pushed him to the side and walked down to the shore, my hand gripping a flashlight as I followed Bob. He'd gone on ahead and was squatting behind some rocks. When I came up behind him with a flashlight, he scowled real big and jerked it from my hands, shutting it off. You'll scare him, you fucking idiot! It was the first time Bob had ever used that language with me. I said, And look here, Bob. But he hissed at me, motioning for me to squat beside him. I wish I'd just gone back to the truck and drank a beer. My knees popped as I got beside him. I looked over the rocks towards the horizon the shore and waves. The sun was just starting to come up, making the sky pink and purple. That's when I first heard it. A voice, soft as lace, rising. Rising past the rocks, past the shore, on the back of the waves. I thought about what I saw that day, many times since. I thought and thought, wondering if it was all real, I'd convinced myself it wasn't for a time or two, figuring it was all some feverish dream. But then I'd see a picture of Bob, and it'd call back to me. I don't know what I'd call what it was, because all the common names are too preposterous. But it was a strange, beautiful thing. Alabaster white skin, freckled and pearled. A lady, or so it seemed, with long, untanned hair. As she approached the shore, I saw the fins, jutting from her shoulders, ending in a massive green-grey tail. I didn't know what she was, and I don't care to name it. At times, I think the fins were a trick of the pale morning, but that tail, massive and writhing like a snake, I can't forget it. I was too shocked to move, squatting and slack-jawed as I gazed on. The thing turned its back from the shore towards the sun. She began to sing. I'd heard tales of sirens before, of Odysseus and his men falling prey to them. 
but the haunting wail the thing gave wasn't no beautiful tune, not like the one afore it. In my dreams I'd hear that dirge, still, followed soon by the sound of a throat gurgling, a voice dying against the crashing waves. I'd not noticed Bob creeping forward. He was less than a yard away from the thing before I noticed his shape. As his hands wrapped around its mouth, its song dying, I finally came to my senses. Bob was atop the creature, hands wrapped over its throat as it writhed beneath him, gripping his wrists and flailing. Bob's face was twisted into a snarl, veins popping along his neck as he tried to snuff out its life. I had risen from behind the rocks to get a better view, stomach churning as I watched. I was beside him before I knew I was. And as I stood there watching the thing fight for its life, Bob Harlow's knuckles turning white, I noticed Bob smiling. He kept on smiling, right until I socked him in the face as hard as I could. He fell to his side, and the creature was upon him in an instant, coiling its tail around him as his mouth descended upon his throat. There was a squelch and a growl. Then blood. So much blood. I ran to the shore towards the truck. Bob had left the keys in the ignition and I prayed they would still crank. When it did, I slammed it in reverse and drove as far as I could from the shore. From that place, Bob's fishing hole, and from that town. I went home, leaving Bob's truck at his house. I went home and stayed there for several days. Eventually the police came knocking, asking about Bob. I told them that Bob had gone off to the shore, stinking drunk and howling. I drove his car home after alerting the cops in Oak Island. They thanked me for my time and went on. Word got around that Bob Harlow had gone missing, and there was another story that travelled too. A tale so tall, most just assumed it was bullshit. It was all about how the cops went to Bob's, and found bodies of ladies attached to great fish tails in the basement. They were stored in great big barrels, pickled. Some were cut open, like he was studying them. Word never got around to saying if those tales were natural, though. That's the whole story, and what I care to share of my stake. There's probably a few details missing. I didn't hear about what happened to Bob's basement. And what was found there? The house burnt down about a month after my return. According to the neighbors, it stunk to high heaven. Like dead fish. Like an old wharf that had been there for years. I don't know what Bob Harlow was studying in that house. But it made every fishing trip I'd gone on suspect. That went back for years. But of all the things I questioned my sanity, chief among them... I question why Bob chose to tell me. I guess I'll ask God when I see him. Or maybe Bob. Whichever it ends up being. Eb Craddock. I was too stunned at first. I put the letter down on the table, slumping my back on the couch. It was a hoax. It had to be. But it was one I didn't have time for at the moment. I was already late for work. Over the next few weeks, I kept an eye open. I watched my doormat for a few hours at a time. And when I wasn't gazing out the peephole, I was researching missing person reports, fisherman stories, and folk tales from Oak Island. There were numerous reports of beautiful music pouring in from the rocks at odd hours. Specifically late at night or early morning. Coincidentally, the best times to fish. A time many boats were just leaving port. Also times when several of them crashed for no discernible reason. Abedias Craddock and Bob Harlow were real people. I'd found Craddock's funeral announcement weeks later, after it happened. After I was sorting through my mail. After I'd calmed down and begun to think the whole thing was a dream. Just like Craddock. He lived a single floor down from me. Swim after me! Those were a boat captain's last words. I think about them often. 
Did he know what was coming? Obviously, he couldn't. Not really. But did any piece of him feel like this would be the last time his lips moved to form a sentence? A fleeting feeling, maybe? An instinct buried inside and pushed away like some awkward cousin to deja vu? Do we get that chance? However small, does the universe ever offer any opportunity to walk away from death? Or does it just happen? And we're gone. As quick as turning off a light. John certainly looked confident as he tied the life preserver firmly around my waist. The strap dug into my chest and it was uncomfortable around my head, but he showed me a way to loosen the string and stick the slack into a loop. He gestured to my wife next, indicating that hers needed to be tightened with both hands. I moved over to help her, and without another word, John hopped over the rail of the lifeboat and into the cool blue ocean behind us. An enormous splash erupted in his wake. The plan was pretty simple. Anna and I were on our honeymoon. We paid Captain John's touring service for breakfast and drinks on the beach of a remote island. It wasn't cheap. We had spent five days in this tropical paradise. We wanted to make the last one special. John disappeared for a moment and then quickly resurfaced. He smiled in our direction, shook loose a thread of soaked hair tentacles, and thumbed over his shoulder, as if to say the water's fine before turning inland to swim towards the island. After a moment of fiddling, we both jumped in after him. I can remember the water feeling cold. That was the first thing that hit me, like a punch right between the eyes. Why the fuck was it so cold? It was summer. We were miles from the equator. And yet, my feet felt like two solid icicles floating beneath me. I moved my body perpendicularly to the ocean floor and felt my toes warm up. Captain John raised his arm up in the distance. He started to swim. We followed. The second odd thing was the color of the water. Now where I grew up, in our neck of the woods you would be lucky to see a foot into the ocean. But in this part of the world, we're used to seeing six or seven feet below. That wasn't possible where we were swimming. Everything below us looked like darkness. I didn't like that. I kept feeling like something could be below me. The waves kicked up as we got closer to the head of the beach. The current took me under a couple of times. I took in several mouthfuls of salty water along the way. Sometime after my second or third coughing spree, I looked up to find John and realized I couldn't find him. Anna was still beside me. She coughed and kicked on her own personal mission. I could tell that we were going in the right direction, but John was gone. I stopped swimming. Hey, where did... The scream that interrupted my sentence only lasted a few seconds. Look, I know how these things are portrayed in movies. The blood squirts out as if from a yogurt tube. The victim shouts, shark, as they heroically battle the beast several times their own size. He punches its eye. The victim escapes. Everyone's home in time for beers at the local shoreside dive bar. But my reality was much quieter. First John was there, then he wasn't, and then he screamed. But the sound didn't last. It was like when you change the channel on TV quickly and you only catch a bit of a conversation. John's scream erupted at full volume, then it muted itself. Shortly after. The water around me started to turn red. Then came the panic. Swim! I screamed. I don't know how many times I yelled it over and over again. Swim! 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 To the island. To land. Land meant safety. Swim! 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 Get the fuck out of here! The riptide by the beach was almost impossible to get through. We went with the direction of the water until we couldn't anymore. Exhausted, I half-dragged my wife through the shallow water, listening to my heartbeat thump through my chest like an anvil, until we finally felt the relief of dry sand under our feet. I look around. We were alone. It took a while for the shock to wear off. Everyone responds differently. Annie sat down on the beach and cried. I put myself into action. 
Action and ideas kept away the bad thoughts. I ran up and down the beach to get a better idea of our surroundings. It was shorter than a mile long and probably thinner than a quarter mile wide. Nearly the entire surface area of the island was consumed by the beach. A few trees were gathered in the center. I checked everywhere, but unfortunately, there was no fresh water. John had been carrying our lunch in his pack. I started to poke through the woods. A plan worked itself together in my head. We needed to reach the boat. I was confident that once we reached it, we would follow the direction the sun set and drive ourselves home. Captain John had anchored us only a couple dozen feet away from the shore. The problem, obviously, was going back the way we came. I got it into my head that we needed a small raft, something that would offer some level of protection from the things that waited below. I pulled together a few loose tree limbs. I cut them at the end with my pocket knife to even them out. I wandered around looking for some sort of string to hold the branches together. I found a fairly thick vine, and though I knew it wouldn't last, it was something. The entire operation took a couple of hours, and I made sure to check in on Annie a couple of times in between, just to make sure she hadn't completely lost it yet. She was getting there. The plan started to make me feel better. I could feel the panic moving away from the center of my brain to somewhere in the back. A task kept me occupied, I guess. You know? It didn't give me time to think about how shitty our chances actually seemed. I had a list of steps put together in my head and I followed them. No more, no less. I had just finished tying up the front end of my raft when Anna screamed. My feet hit the hot sand in a full sprint. Unsolicited images filled my head. Annie in the shark's mouth. Annie trying to swim away. Annie slowly slipping under the surface as a fresh pool of red surrounds her mangled body. I arrived at the beachhead to find her intact. No blood. No injuries. She pointed to something in the distance. It took me a minute to catch my breath, figure out what she was talking about, and squint into the distance. But when I did, that's when I saw an arm. It floated lazily in the current. It almost could have been a piece of seaweed or other debris. But even from this distance, I could see the outline of a four-leaf clover tattoo. Anna said she could see his wedding ring, but her eyes were always better than mine. I thought that meant the shark was gone. I don't know why. I guess maybe I thought he was full and had enough human for one day. But a moment later, a fin appeared, and the arm lazily dropped underwater. Then another fin came. Then another. Then ten more. It wasn't long until we sat witness to an entire feeding frenzy. There must have been dozens. White sharks, bull sharks, you name it. We could only see their fins and faces when they surfaced. Their bodies thrashed about in the current. Waves listed around them. The deep shade of red from John's blood had almost completely faded. There was nothing left for all of them to eat. But they waited around anyway. It was as if they could see us stranded on the beach. And I know it sounds absurd, but it felt that way. So we waited too. Our first night on the beach was uneventful. It rained for a bit. Anna found a good spot under a jutting rock and tried to get some sleep. I continued fiddling with my raft. I strengthened the ties with a couple more pieces of vine. I added a couple boards to make it longer. I even gave it a test dive around six inches into the water by the beach. I made sure Annie was awake to watch me for that part. I knew we had to make the journey before dehydration set in. The sun would be hot in the morning. I could already feel the dryness pickling the back of my throat. Those gulps of salt water on the way in had definitely sped up my thirst. You can last for weeks without food but only a couple of days without water. I knew that we wouldn't have many chances. I went to sleep for an hour with a plan to build my strength for one last hurrah. I woke up to an impossibly bright sun. Annie was standing over the raft. I knew she was still scared. 
but she looked determined. That gave me the confidence I needed. Time to go? She asked. Time to go, I confirmed. The water seemed calm as we pushed the raft over the shallows. Any signs of last night's feeding frenzy had evaporated. Clear blue sea surrounded us as tiny little fish darted around our feet. I kept my eyes fixated on the dark waters in the distance. I got it into my head that if I saw the shark, I could do something about it, which was stupid. We were already too far from the beach to escape. No one can outswim a killing machine. We would be dead. But control of the situation gave me confidence in the situation. So I went with him. At the edge of the dark water, I lifted Annie onto the top of the raft. The tree limbs buckled and moved around nervously. But my craftsmanship held up. I jumped on board beside her. And just like that, Annie dug my makeshift oar into the seabed and pushed us off into the abyss. We were about fifty feet from John's boat when we spotted the first fin. It was in the distance, probably a couple hundred yards away, and that gave us hope. Maybe the fish moved on. Maybe we would be okay. And he even laughed and gave me a bit of a thumbs up as I pulled the oar from her hand and pushed it a little faster. There was no warning. One moment we were paddling towards salvation, smiles on our faces, and the next, we were in the dark water. I felt something scaly brush against my leg. It must have cut me because I could feel the salt water mixing into my scrape. I knew I was bleeding before I saw it. That's when I knew we were fucked. Panic took a hold once again. Swim! I screamed. I kept waiting for the thing to hit me. I thought, since I was the one bleeding, the shark would spare Anna and kill me. And I was alright with that. As absurd as it sounds, I couldn't stand the thought of losing my wife. But if death is as simple as turning off a light, well, then maybe that would be better. The shark hit me on my left ankle. I wasn't going to go down that easy. I kicked it with my right, over and over again, like they tell you to do in the movies. I aimed for its face. Nothing worked. Soon we were in a barrel roll. My head dipped under the water. Salt water filled my lungs. I was more than ready for this to be my end. I accepted it. Annie had escaped. Like the TV channels flipping in and out, I could hear her climbing out of the water. She was going to make it. Everything else would be okay. The lights of the horizon started to go out. But just before they did... A large slap erupted in my face. The water shook from the vibration. I couldn't figure out what the fuck just happened, but the shark let go of my ankle. I swam deliriously. To my left, a slap echoed by my shoulder. Fins surrounded me now. Each time they hit the water, the sound kicked me into another gear. Slap! 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 I couldn't figure out what was going on. There had to be twenty fins around me, all slapping their fins like twenty-somethings at a fish concert. Annie was screaming something, but I couldn't hear her. I dug both hands into the current and pulled myself towards her voice, with every ounce of strength left in my body. The fins continued to surround me. Every five seconds or so, they would slap the water an inch from my face. They seemed awfully careful not to hit me. When I was about ten feet from the boat, I could see Annie laughing, and that really threw me off. Here I am, inches from death, fighting for my life, and she's laughing? She cuffed her hands and repeated the thing she'd been shouting. Dolphins! I looked to my left. A fish longer than me matched my pace stroke by stroke. When it reached up to slap the water again, I finally realized what was happening. They were protecting me. I swam faster. More than anything, the dolphins gave me hope. Two of them matched my pace all the way in. They felt like my bodyguards. Annie tossed down a life jacket. I grabbed it. She pulled me the rest of the way to the boat. As she was helping me on board the boat, I looked down to check out my ankle, which was no more than a pile of hamburger meat. Underneath it was a massive shadow. I didn't have to see it up close to know it was a white shark. My foot was a bloody stump, but my adrenaline kept me moving. I wrapped my leg in one of the spare t-shirts. I helped Annie turn over the engine, 
I pointed in the direction of the rising sun and said, let's go home. Some time after that, I passed out. It took 45 staples and countless stitches to put my foot back together. Annie had to be hospitalized due to dehydration. There were some scary moments in the first couple of days after our recovery, but we were okay. We lived, and for that I am more than thankful. They never found John's body. I suppose there would not have been much left to find of it anyway. It's been years since this happened. My wife and I have moved on to a happy life, with happy kids, and much happier memories than this one. But I'll still never be able to forget it. I still have nightmares to this day. I'll never forget how close I came to having the lights going out. I'll never forget the happy look on John's eyes as he thumbed over his shoulder for us to follow. Like a fish in the sea. Completely unaware of the chaos that awaited him. To this day, I will never swim in dark water. Again. In the news, flesh-eating sea bugs in Australian Ocean. By Tobias Wade. I'm sure many of you have read the recent news story about the flesh-eating bugs. The guy didn't feel a thing standing in the water, but when he stepped out, his feet were savaged into a bloody mess, completely perforated by the creatures. That may sound bad, but after what I've seen, I know it's going to get a whole lot worse. If you're like me, then your reaction went something like this. What the fuck, gross? I don't want to look at that, or... But a bug did that? Actually, that's kind of cool. I want to see it again. First of all, I live in Australia. So, assuming all the killer jellyfish and snakes weren't deterrents enough, I'm pretty sure swimming is off the menu for me. It did give me an idea, though. So far, I've been stubbornly refusing to acknowledge my summer break science project. We just get six weeks, unlike the States. But class will be starting up again soon, and I had to pick something. What could be more fun than studying flesh-eating bugs? A little research revealed that the perpetrator was probably Lysinacidae, a family of marine amphipods. They're a type of detritivore, which means their diet is primarily comprised of decomposing organic matter. As the usual case recently demonstrated, however, they are perfectly adept at shredding living tissue as well. I actually live pretty close to the beach where it happened, so I figured I'd just collect a water sample for my display, write a report, post some newspaper clippings on the poster board, and voila, all done. The only tricky part was that I had to go at night. The beach was temporarily closed for an environmental safety evaluation, but all accounts online suggested it was an incredibly rare and isolated incident. I figured I wouldn't even find any of them, but just to be safe, I was up to my knees in rubber galoshes and didn't wade in very far. I filled a couple glass vials before I got out of the water, but I couldn't tell much from just eyeballing them. The water was murky, and even though I saw some little creatures floating around, they could have been anything. I was all set to hike back to my car when I saw a flashlight scouring the beach. I wasn't allowed to be there, so my first instinct was to run. There was nowhere to hide on the open sand, though and I figured they'd spot me as soon as I started to move. All I could do was press myself into the sand and hope for the best. The beam of light passed right over my head. I clenched my eyes shut, praying they'd missed me. All clear, sir? Good. Deep voice, and gravelly like it was obscured by years of smoke. Back the van up here and keep it moving. We're gonna be in and out in ten minutes. I heard a car pull up in the nearby closed parking lot. I didn't lift my head because I was terrified that any movement would give me away. I had the feeling that these guys weren't supposed to be here either, but that might make it even worse for me if I was found. It sounded like they were dragging something heavy through the sand. I wanted to lift my head so damn bad. I lifted my head just enough to see a massive dolly piled high with bags like fertilizer. It was being pushed across the sand on mounted skis by four men in dark blue overalls. 
It's going to get a lot more visible when the activating catalyst hits the water, the voice said. He was an old man, long white hair flowing halfway to his ass. Line up the bags and don't pull them in until they're all open and ready to go. Three minutes tops. Make it happen. The men in overalls pulled long bone-handled knives from their belt and systematically slashed the bags open. I strained from my prone position, but I couldn't see what was inside. Their attention was all diverted, though, so this seemed like a good chance to make my escape. I pushed myself up to my hands and knees and started a huddled dash back towards the street. It must have been close to midnight then. Around ten seconds later, it felt like noon. A wave of green light overtook me from behind and illuminated the sky into ghastly pale. I stumbled over myself, pinching flat again before looking behind. The men were pouring the bags into the ocean one by one, and where the powder inside met the water, an explosive wave of luminescence blasted out like lightning streaking through the waves. It took my eyes several seconds to adjust before I realized the old man was staring directly at me. Robbed of the cover of darkness, I lay stark under his steel gaze. If I had hesitated any longer, I would have been dead. A loud crack rent the night air and the sand ruptured directly in front of me. Another shot, this time tearing through the air an inch from my shoulder. I was back on my feet, dodging through the palm trees that flourished densely at the end of the beach. Shouting interspersed the explosions of light behind me. I didn't trust the open road around my car, so I stayed in the thicket until the shouting passed. A few moments later, I heard the roar of a van ripping out of the parking lot. I counted to a hundred before I could breathe evenly again. As far as I could tell, they were gone. I crept back into the empty beach to try and figure out what the hell had happened. The water was still glowing softly green, but it was nothing like the display I'd seen moments ago. The ocean silently churned and boiled as dark shapes slipped below the surface. Something was feeding on whatever these guys had dumped into the water. The tracks from the dolly were hastily swept up all the way to the parking lot. It looks like they were in a hurry. Approaching the water, I found a small pile of the powder that had been carelessly spilled onto the beach. I gathered it up in one of my extra vials before hightailing it out of there. I'm not sure who I could contact and be taken seriously about this, so I resolved to do a little experiment of my own. When I got home, I poured my samples of ocean water into a big mixing bowl, then dumped the powder into the water. Sure enough, there was a bright flash upon contact, although nothing compared to the neon splendor in the ocean. Within about ten minutes, the light had all but completely faded, but even my small sample had begun to boil and churn. I left the mixture out overnight and went to bed, checking it first thing in the morning when I woke up. The bowl was nearly overflowing with squirming dark shapes, each almost four inches long. Rows of razor-sharp teeth like needles flashed in the light, and a hundred little legs flailed against the walls of the confined space. Out of morbid curiosity, I dropped a fried chicken drumstick into the water. One of them attempted to swallow it instantaneously, becoming hopelessly encumbered on the bone. The others wasted no time in taking advantage of the opportunity, devouring the helpless creature alive. Within seconds, even the chicken bone had completely vanished and all those beady little eyes would turn to fix on me for their next meal. <laughs> they didn't get it. By midday, there was only four of them left. They were eating each other with unrestrained savagery, snapping off the legs of any that swam too close. By evening, there was only three, but they had grown almost a foot long. I had to dump them into the bathtub to keep them from getting out. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but the limited space and meager scraps I'm sustaining them with must limit their growth eventually. I can only imagine what's going on right now in the vastness of the ocean, where they're free to reach their full potential. I'm not allowed to talk about Paps well. by Bad Fake Smiles. I've been keeping this a secret for years now. 
It's right inside my soul, but I couldn't really care less if it spreads and eats me alive. I kept it inside me, nurtured it, and let it fester like a nasty cut. So now you're probably thinking, then why are you suddenly revealing this to us now? To be frank, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's my hero complex. That was the original reason why I trained to be an officer. I'm thinking maybe I could still warn you, alarm the public. But to be honest, I just probably want to convince myself I still draw breath for a reason. My name is Lance Becker. Not that it matters, I just think it's polite to know a stranger's name before the stranger's story. I used to work in a police station ten years ago. Now I own a bookstore near my apartment. I told the chief that I was leaving because I wanted to pursue my artistic calling to write. I want to inject color in lifeless white canvases with every stroke and scratch of pen. That's the bullshit I told them. But I'm pretty sure they didn't buy it. If they did, then they wouldn't still be watching me 24-7. No matter how much dirt you smear into those bumpers and windows, I know a discreet government car when I see one. You see, I left the force for a reason I'm not allowed to discuss. A reason I couldn't discuss, but I've moved past the sleepless nights and haunted visions. I'm ready to tell you what happened to Papswell. It was June 26, 2008. I was in charge of the night shift. Together with me at the station was my good friend Brom and the new girl, Joanne. Brom and I went way back to high school. We consider ourselves particularly ordinary. We grew up without any answers to what we want our future jobs to be. We never aspired of being a scientist, a programmer, or an athlete. But at least I had some semblance of a goal or dream. I've always wanted to join the Justice League. Be a hero, you know? Well, you can figure out how that went down. When the time came where we'd have to answer the question for real, backed up in the corner, Brahm and I simply just decided to join the police force. Joanna's story is quite different. She wanted this position. She had the bright story at perspective of what it's like working as an officer. Didn't want to break it to her. She needed to figure that out for herself. Not like that, though. Not that phone call. 2.35 a.m. We're all minding our own business inside the station. The room was almost pitch black if it wasn't for the warm light our desk lamps radiated. We'd only get up from our seats to piss, stretch, or fetch coffee. Brom occasionally threw things at me to keep himself entertained. Whether it be stupid dad jokes or peanuts, it was a 50-50. I didn't mind. I needed a reason to turn my neck away from the computer anyway. It was a somewhat peaceful night. Until the phone beside me rang. Brom almost immediately groaned because it meant we probably needed to do our actual jobs. Joanne perked up like a puppy hearing a bag of treats being shaken up. Me? I flinched. I got surprised. I never expected a call at 2am, so I had to take a deep breath to calm my suddenly racing heart before I could answer. The man's name was Peter. Peter Ingram. He was a resident in a small neighboring town named Papswall. The last time I checked, it had a population of only 300 or so. It was the seaside, so it was kind of a fishing place. People there were... traditional, I'd like to say. Most of the town was still covered in wet soil, and the streets weren't made of concrete either. I only got to visit the town when I was a kid, and the only thing I remembered was the smell of fish in the air. They had their own police station, if I could remember correctly, so that call was very odd and alarming. That wasn't what gave the situation away, though. It was the loud, panting, and panicked voice he had whilst talking to me. He was stuttering, catching his breath and trying his best to relay the situation. I thought to myself, he must have killed someone. Now he might be in danger. Someone might want to hurt him. Was there fire? A hostage situation? Is his family in danger? In need of an ambulance? It wasn't any of those things. A girl flew to the sky. That was word per word. What? I knee-jerkingly replied. He said that a girl was hoisted up into the sky. 
Lots of people saw it, he said. And she disappeared in the dark rumbling clouds above. The clouds, he mentioned them in detail, too. It wasn't like clouds you typically see outside. It was kind of a blanket. He told me it was just one big sheet, the size of the whole town. No stars, no moon. Just clouds. I turned the loudspeaker on so the two people around me could take a listen. Maybe because I was waiting for Brom to say it, and of course he did. It's a bloody prank, Brom sneered. I gave a flat smile. Sir, I need more details of your situation, I asked. Brom was running his finger across his neck and shaking his head. Peter proceeded to recount what had happened. He told me that he was simply taking a cigarette on his porch when people started running in the streets, shouting to get the residents inside their houses. He immediately complied out of panic. Within the safety of his windows, he saw a woman, with her head held up high, floating towards the clouds. Sir, I need you to stay put. Lock your doors. We'll be there shortly. I simply responded without a second thought. You mental! Brom raised his voice. He got up and walked towards me to place his finger on the mute button. This is a prank, he tilted, and lowered his body to reach my face. You seriously want to drive out of town at three in the morning because the fish town gave birth to Supergirl? Before I could answer back with my own snarky comment, the phone call dropped. Brom raised his eyebrows as he stretched and went back to his seat. I don't know, it sounded like he really needed help. Joanne was standing the whole time, rubbing the tip of her fingers. Her eyes looked at me, waiting for my response. Well, they shouldn't have hung up. I nonchalantly replied. Joanne hasn't got a chance to sit down when the phone rang again. I put it on speaker. Where are you guys? It's been five goddamn hours! We all stared at each other in confusion. It was Peter again, only this time his voice was shaking. The words couldn't escape his mouth anymore unlike the first call. He sounded like his lips were quivering. Emily, my wife. He proceeded to moan and cry on the phone. I asked him what was wrong, and the words that came were the most bizarre at the time. Fish lines, they're hanging from the sky. He described the town to be ridden, with hooks dangling three to six feet off the ground. They were all coming from the clouds above their town. They were spread unevenly, almost depending on the number of people nearby each house. All of our faces wrinkled in disgust as he proceeded to describe the supposed baits. He said the lions had fat yellow worms pierced on each hook, resembling maggots the size of pups. They had beady black and blinking eyes decorated around its body. It dripped viscous fluid to the ground beneath them, making puddles all over the streets. My wife Emily. She was looking out of the window. She said her, she said her father was still outside. Peter sobbed uncontrollably. So did you get the father back in the house? Brom suddenly shouted from his desk, losing all sense of professionalism. Wouldn't blame him at that point. We're all getting dragged into this person's narrative. No, you don't understand. Her father has been dead for years now. Silence blanketed the room. All I heard from Peter was mumbling at that point. I looked at Joanne and Brom, and it was easy to tell that we'd all got a little spooked out. I focused again and started to tell Peter to calm down. He continued. After Peter's wife went out to open their front door, he said that she immediately ran towards one of the hooks and grabbed the worm. She let it crawl inside of her mouth, as Peter said, letting it squirm and go down, bulging into her throat, down her chest, and disappear inside of her stomach. The fishing line was all that remained on her slime-drenched lips. So before Peter could chase her down, the line tensed and whirred, making the sound of a strung guitar string, before hoisting her up like she weighed nothing and disappeared into the clouds. Peter told us that he was in shock and that he didn't realize he was walking towards another hunk. His neighbor came across from the street, shouted at him, and snapped him out of it. His neighbor then proceeded to throw a walkie-talkie at him, which Peter carried back inside of the house. That was my good pal, Billy. I'm talking to him through the walkie-talkie. He told me that the hooks are reeling in tons of people from the town. 
dozens of them are going up by the minute, like idiots that get themselves snagged to be dragged up like dolls. I'm scared, officer. I'm really, really... Peter continued to sob on the line. We need to go, Joanne interrupted. Well, you're fucking full of beans. To where? Whole damn thing seems a bit dodgy to me. Brom tried to refute. They need help. We need to do something. What? Something? Uh, do you even know what the fuck is going on? I don't! Brown was on the brink of shouting. They raised their voices higher, inching towards each other, trying hard to make the other person back down. I was as confused as both of them, but I had to intervene. We're going, I said, although almost whispering. They both paused and looked at me. Brom was taking a deep breath, ready to say something that would probably have led me to a different decision, but I said no before the words could even climb out of his chest. The light from our lamps wasn't just enough to reveal the sweat beating on our foreheads, but also how our shoulders stiffened, how Joanne kept touching her buttons, and how Brom kept biting the skin of his lips. We were all wrapped around the sudden anxiety that we failed to notice that Peter had already dropped the call. We felt the seconds of just sitting around press heavily on our chest. Okay, I gathered my thoughts. Joanne, keep an eye on the phone. Contact the neighboring town's police departments. Innsmouth, come with me. I can go. Joanne stopped me before fetching the keys from the rack. Well, she wants to go. Brom nervously smiled. They gave Brom a meaningful glare, one that would etch the seriousness of the situation on this damn skull. I left the front doors and started the car. Brom entered the vehicle almost in a trance. He kept bouncing his legs the moment he sat down, silently looking at the dark road ahead of us. I have no words to say during the drive either. It was an hour-long drive to the town, but it felt like we came much sooner than we wanted to be. I let out a deep sigh upon stopping at the road sign. Welcome to Papswall. Population, 652. From our car, we saw windows and street lamps lit warm yellow-orange amidst the dark and blue night. It was peaceful, quiet. We didn't want quiet, however. We both froze in place, unable to move a foot in front of the other, seemingly waiting for the first one to take the lead. Hello! Brom shouted as loud as he could. I jumped. Felt as if I was about to vomit my heart out. Hello, someone! This is Ash! Brom! I called out, whispering. The fuck are you doing? I don't want to go. Oh, I don't. His voice started to crack. He walked around in circles, his hands behind his neck. He then looked up. I knew it was to push the tears back, but I decided to shut up about it. Instead, I gave the most convincing chuckle I could out of my ass. Dude, come on. It's probably just a prank, right? I smiled at him. He smiled back. Enough to give me a bit of comfort. Enough to push myself to walk past the sign first. Walking forward, the salty scent of the sea welcomed us with a cold hug. The people of the town, however, never gave us the same courtesy. The houses were all lit up, but not a single shadow could be seen inside the windows. The front doors were wide open. They creaked and slammed almost in sync, matching our every step on the soft, wet land. Brom's gun was pointing at every corner I shined my light. I was honestly getting more nervous about getting accidentally shot by him due to his nervous and snappy movements and his heavy breaths. I looked back and he was sweating like a horse despite the cold breeze. I wasn't a tough nut myself. I just needed to put up a front until we met someone. Anyone. I look, Lance. No hooks from the sky. Yeah, no hooks. Honestly, I wasn't so sure if that was good or bad. We've made some distance going inside the town. Our steps made crunching noise on the rocky ground, so I looked back, and when I heard Brom wasn't taking any more steps, I checked. He was looking down, his eyes wide open and his hands almost loose, ready to drop the gun. What's wrong? I asked. I approached him, shined my light at his feet. My jaw slowly dropped. So did my heart. It was the puddle. The white, glistening pool of gunk. 
Brom raised his foot and the liquid dripped off of it like snot. I looked around and it was everywhere, every six feet, puddles of slime. And if our memory served us right, we both knew where it came from. I think we should leave, Bra mumbled, and I couldn't have agreed more. I grabbed his arm and pulled him away from being fixated on the puddle. We briskly walked back, passed through several empty houses, yet the sign near the car were nowhere to be found. We started to walk faster, slowly transitioning into a sprint, until we caught ourselves running. We never took a turn, yet it felt like we were lost. The houses, the street lights, the roads, and the puddles all looked the same. I was panicking. I kept on looking back to make sure Brahm was still following me. The last thing I want is to be alone in this godforsaken place. At that point, we both knew that something weird was going on. We were going around in circles. The town seemed to be alive, morphing itself to keep us in. We just didn't want to acknowledge it. So we kept running, even broke the most logical thing to do and started taking turns, left and right, looking for something different. An establishment, a shop, anything. But it was the same old empty wooden houses everywhere. We stopped to catch our breaths. Brom fell to his knees, digging his hands in the dirt. Lance, what's happening? He started to burst down into tears. I looked around whilst grabbing the hair on the back of my head looking for a sign, looking for a way out, when something caught both of our attention. The phone was ringing inside the house on our left. Where are you going? Someone might be able to help us, I replied. I pulled my gun out and pointed at the front door before kicking it in. I didn't need to. The door opened by itself because of the wind, almost causing me to lose my balance from trying to kick it in and trip. I called out for anyone inside the house. No response. I slowly approached the phone. It was dirty off-white, with a pink hand-stitched holder at its handle. I took a deep breath and answered. What blasted on my ears was the sound of a grating scream coming from a woman. No! Hello? Please, stay put! I pulled back a little before I could recognize the voice. Joanne? I replied. Becker? How are you there? We're at Pap's wall. But how? You left just minutes ago. Everything was starting to spin around me. What? I asked her. Lance! The sign! Brom called for me from outside. It felt like a knife was pulled out of my chest. My smile was almost ear to ear. Joanne, have you called neighboring stations? No answer call already dropped. I didn't have time to think about what happened and simply ran outside to the house and followed Brom sprinting towards the car. When I got to start the engine, I noticed that he was still standing outside the car, looking at the town. I lowered the window to call to him, but he wasn't answering. I got out of the car again. Brom, let's go, I called out. I looked into the direction he was staring at and saw it. Something was glinting in the distance just beneath the street lamp. Mom? He muttered. Every hair on my body stood up. Brom, are you okay? I got nervous, especially when I saw him take a couple of steps toward it. My heart dropped, seeing him lean over, ready to turn back to town. The adrenaline kicked in, causing me to grab and wrap my arms around him before he could start chasing after whatever that was. Brom, Brom, your mom's not here. She's back in England, remember? I said, holding him as he struggled. After a few seconds, he started to calm down. He looked at me, confused as to why we were on the ground. Yeah, she is. We went inside the car and had a silent trip back to the station. We were still trying to process everything. I haven't even told Brom about what happened when I answered the phone. He seemed lost in his own thoughts. He never cared to ask anyway. We got back to the station at around 4 a.m. It was dark, but the sun was starting to peek over the horizon. When we arrived at the station, Brom asked me to go ahead inside. He wanted some time alone in the car. The feeling of confusion and dread still followed me inside the station. It didn't help that everything was so quiet. The only sound that could be heard was the buzzing of the air conditioning. 
I found Joanne standing and staring blankly beside my desk, whilst holding the phone on her shoulders. Joanne? I called her. I grabbed her hand to receive the phone and put it down. She flinched the moment I touched her. Her eyes welled up and her legs started to go weak, almost causing her to fall to the ground. I was ready to catch her when she grabbed my desk and stood back up herself. No words were spoken between the three of us for the rest of the shift. It was safe to say that none of us got proper sleep after going home too. The next day, men in suits were swarming inside the station. The chief called me in and told me that some guys wanted to talk to me for an interview. To talk to the three of us. The suits called us one by one into the interrogation room. Inside were four folders, one for each of her names, and another labeled Case 7. They had their way with words, but to dumb it all down, all I heard was, shut up about it or die. It was pretty obvious to me that they had no idea what was happening either, or at least they aren't in any control of what happened. What they do control, however, is information. It was ten years ago, and as far as I know, the town of Papswall was erased from the face of the earth. I heard it was nothing but a barren wasteland now. It's not on the internet, nor any map you can find. No one would ever remember its name. Except for the three of us, I guess. Brom was the first to resign. He went back to England and stayed with his family. I resigned after. Having to see the phone beside me every day became too much for me to handle. Joanne? She stayed. But I haven't heard from her in a long time. This kind of thing sticks with you. Haunts your very core. Nothing you can do about it. You can't escape. So I let it eat me. It ate me up like maggots. Even though the suits tried their best, I still managed to save something from what happened. I got a copy of the recording of the calls. It was my own sick, masochistic idea of trying to remember the 652 people that disappeared that day. I still play the recordings on loop before I go to sleep. But not all of them. Not until recently. Maybe this is the reason why I decided to tell this story. Why I decided to scratch the itch a little. Not to warn you of the large clouds and dangling hooks, no. But because Joanne sent me something. Something I didn't need to hear. Maybe I just want someone, you, to take a glimpse of the horror we've been through. Not so much of a hero now, am I? I didn't need to know. I didn't need to hear the call that Joanne received right after Brahm and I left the station. But there's no point in crying over spilled milk. The suits are coming for me now after this anyway. So I just let it eat me. Let it eat my soul, and let it eat my sanity, or what's left of it. Start playback of recording, 26th of June, 2008, 3.06. Good morning, um, Ashbury Police Department. Hello, I was talking to Billy over the walkie-talkie and he said there might be a way out of- <laughs> Sir, Mr. Ingram. Oh God, Billy's kid, he's outside. He's running towards a hook. No! Joey, stop! Mr. Ingram, whatever you do, please stay put. He grabbed his son. They're both being po- Oh, God. <laughs> Billy, let go! <laughs> Billy! Sir. Peter, uh, who are you people? <laughs> Billy, where are you? What's happening up there? Hello? <laughs> what was that? Nothing matters now, Peter. What? What are you talking about? <laughs> Billy? It's real, Peter. It exists. And it looks hungry. Cetus, 
by Scorch933. To this I tell you my story. I have no home but the boat and the sea. I spend the majority of my life out at sea, on the ship. We sailed to parts unknown back and forth, carrying goods in trade. That was my life, and it came to an abrupt end one particular night at sea. We were sailing from the coast of America to Portugal, having only left Charleston a few days ago. It was a stormy twilight, the moon shining through dark clouds, pouring rain down on the ship. The waves were rough, tossing the ship left to right. I was attempting to tie down the cargo above deck more sufficiently, and it was then that a rough wave hit the ship and caused me to slip. My fellow crewmen saw me slip out of the ship and cursed, calling out that a man had gone overboard. The waves were too rough to turn back for me, and though they tried, though I cursed, though I screamed for them, I was merely drowned under rising waves. My last thought, last sight, as I fell deeper into the water, looking at our ship floating away, my ship floating away. My last thought as the waters rose and the light from the surface got darker and darker, and I lost breath and simply fell unconscious, knowing I would not awake. I awoke, however, coughing out water and mud on a rock. I looked to my sides, arising, and I was shin deep in thick muddy brown liquid. I attempted to remove myself from the liquid, trudging, clothes soaked and heavy, onto dry ground. I looked at my surroundings and it appeared as though I was on the coast of a large rocky mountainous island. Wooden planks and torn masts were washed ashore, as well as a large wooden hull of a ship. It appeared to be a large caravel of some classification, 17th century most likely. Old, tattered, and torn tarps lay across the ship and ground. Upon entering the ship, I found it abandoned aside from books and decorations in the cabin. A small journal or log dictated that the ship had wrecked ashore on a deserted swamp island, I can only presume this one, and that the crew had set out for inland within the swamp. I decided that I should get to Alpine ground to look for civilization. They were most likely no longer alive, but perhaps there would be remnants of a camp, things I could use. I began looking for a way up the mountains. The rocks were large and trembling, but I began to make my way onto solid ground. As I climbed the grassy, mossy, dried dirt and rock mountain, I looked down the horizon. It could only be hours until sunrise. The sky a dark purple clear sky. I looked at the swamp mires beneath me, and the jungles were thick. I could see nothing but a small clearing in the jungle, leading to a large lake in the center of the island, flowing into the ocean. I began to make my way down into the swamp jungle to head for the lake. As I began to descend, I thought to call out for anyone. Is anyone there? I screamed for somebody anybody to help, and there was an echo, and silence. As I continued my descent, the earth began to tremble. An earthquake most likely. Rocks would be falling down the unstable mountainside any moment as the earth shook, and I lost my footing. I fell, sliding and slipping over the ground down the mountain, every time I flipped, hitting my head and back. When I finally stopped, I was at the edge of the mountain and jungle. My back ached with pain and face was hurting, my nose most likely broken. I began to move into the jungle, stepping through the vines and hearing the chirping of crickets and buzzing of mosquitoes. Every step I made crunched on the twigs and sticks on the ground. As I stepped for what seemed like an hour, the sticks and trees began to thin out and I saw the grassy fern clearing. I ran towards it looking for signs of camps, civilizations, anything. But it was clear, abandoned. I moved towards the lake, where the grass stopped growing and the rock formation encircled the entire lake. Stone spires surrounded the circumference of the lake, and the center was black, thick, swampy water. 
Something in my gut told me I was in the wrong location, as if something was certainly wrong. My suspicions and premonitions were confirmed when the ground shook a second time. This time the swamp water began to bubble. This time the trembling was so great I fell flat to the ground. The rumbling shook my body, bouncing it violently. As I tried to regain focus, I was only hit against the rock ground harder. When the quake finally ceased, I reclaimed my focus and began to look towards the lake. Nothing seemed to be amiss, but the water splashed across the rock formation. Something had fallen into it, or emerged out of the water. I glanced around to identify what this was, failing to spot anything out of the ordinary. Then, off in the distance, I heard crumbling. I turned to direct my focus towards the sound, and thus is when I saw it. The visage of something. A monster. A colossal abomination towering higher than the Washington Monument. Its black, turned, tentacle-like arms swung against the mountain, still dripping black water onto the ground. Its squamous body slowly turning from the mountain to face towards me. As it turned, I saw its underside body, lacerated from the rocks, bleeding green thick liquid. Its grotesque head angled to confront me. Its eyes, black all but the center irises, a deep crimson vermilion faced and stared back at me. I stood, amazed and horrified, as its gigantic, hideous head turned. Its face bowed towards mine, proceeding ever closer. Its eyes of fire were now staring back, the images displayed capable of driving the strongest minds insane. It was that particular moment I lost my mind. I had stared into the depths of monstrosities unimaginable. Thunder cracked in the sky, and I fell to the ground. What happened from then remains a blur. I remember little, only waking up on board an incoming vessel. I had not ever seen such indescribable horror in my lifetime, only able to ponder where it went. The crew who had rescued me had ventured into the island, recalling the lake I remembered but did not mention to them lest they deemed me mad. I know that should I ever mention these horrors to the public ear, I would be deemed insane and locked away like a lunatic. I know that one day the creature will rise again. This time, it will make itself apparent to humanity. It knows me. It would recognize me. I know it comes for me. I know it has followed me. It's only living witness. Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft I'm writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Penniless and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from the garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawling pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk into the later degradation, so that our vessel was made legitimate prize. Must we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal indeed was the discipline of our captors, the five days after we were taken I managed to escape alone in a small boat, with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, 
and no island or coast was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the utterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save for a vastness reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness and stillness of the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position, through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under the unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of this new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might, nor were there any seafowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for travelling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odour of the fish was maddening, but I was much too concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still travelled towards the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I first espied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound which turned out to be much larger than it appeared from a distance, an intervening valley setting it out in a sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastical gibbous moon that had risen far above the eastern plain I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of that parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illuminate. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscence of Paradise Lost 
and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashionable realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks that stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian depths where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending sun. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with a sensation I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude, and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of a scientist or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near its zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, widening out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphs unknown to me, and unlike anything I'd ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size were an array of bar-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of Dora. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least, a certain sort of men. Though the creatures were shown distorting like fishes in waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of Poe or Bulwa, they were damnably human in general outline despite webbed hands and feet. Shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but a little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck as this unexpected glimpse into the past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemus-like and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my fabric ascent off the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. 
I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in San Francisco Hospital, brought thither by the captain of an American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did it seem necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legends of Dagon, the fish god, but soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has only given transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all. Having written a full account for the information or contemptuous amusement of my fellow men, often I ask myself if it could not have all been a pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likeliness on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind, of a day when the land shall sink, and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immensely slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand, the window, the window. Fisher of Man by But I Don't Want to Be a Pirate I used to bartend at this hole-in-the-wall dive bar down in South Boston back in the mid-2000s. The kind of rusty, run-down little shithole with rust-weeping nails that you'll only find in spitting distance from any of the wharfs and harbors of the world. On a slow day once a week, and twice on pay weeks, give or take, a drunkard by the name of Brandon would stop in, lay three twenties on the counter, and yammer these fucking stories at me, until his money ran out or his ass fell off the stool. Or both. Most of his stories were the typical meandering ramblings of a barfly, this bitch thought she was too good, and that IRS is always trying to fuck me. Stuff like that. But he always put back enough cheap whiskey for a scotch horse, and tipped well. And per drink. So, until and unless he became completely incoherent, he had my ear most nights. One night, though, the jaundiced little fucker told a story that I had to give him some credit for. One that chilled me. Got to me a little bit and it's the only one I remember these days. It was a Wednesday, something like that, probably four in the afternoon, and Brennan had to have been on his fourth daily pour, convalescing his cashews in his fingers. He always asked me for a bowl of these salted fucking cashews we had. Then he turns to me, ready to yammer the hours away. Hey, Chuck! He started, calling at me too loudly for the distance we were apart. I got a good one for you. If you like a good story. And so I nodded politely, as I always did. Walked over to hear his slurred nonsense for the day. And here's what Brandon the Boff Fly told me. To the best of my recollection. You know I used to be a medic in the Coast Guard back when I still lived in Miami? He began. Not for too long, on account of when I heard my bum shoulder playing backyard tackle in summer 86. I told you about that, right, Chuck? Yeah, I must have. 
Anyways, back in 84, they had me doing chopper rescues out at sea. Some poor fuckers would always get their fishing boats out in storms. Or nasty ship fires or the like, and they'd fly us out to put people in those little baskets and haul them up to the chopper to rescue them. Hero shit, you know? We'd be out in the wind and the rain and shit, getting tossed and everything. But we were friggin' badasses back then, you know? Anyways, this one day, we were out on a search and rescue looking for this big fancy yacht. Some bigwig hedge fund zillionaire and his family had gone and gotten lost, and hadn't shown up in Bimini when they were supposed to, and couldn't get him on the radio. They'd been missing for about three days, and we were told the yacht was pretty massive, like one with a crew and butlers and shit. So we were looking out for a big old son of a bitch, maybe banged up on a sandbar. But instead, we see this life raft. The big orange polygon type you saw in that Tom Hanks movie with a volleyball. And we can see that there's a guy in it, as well as a dog. Chocolate lab it looked like. When we got the chopper down low, we could see him up close. So we send in one of our guys, Richie, down there in the basket. And he pulls the guy up and we load him onto our stretcher. Kid was probably 25, sunbaked to shit, and damn near passed out. But just as Richie goes back to go down for the dog, the kid sits up in the gurney like goddamn Frankenstein and grabs Richie's arm. Damn near popped his shoulder out, Richie told me. And then starts begging us to leave the dog. Just pleading with me and Rich, in this rambling sort of way. It'll kill you, he told us, and we figured maybe he'd become rabid out on the trip or something. I don't really know. But the guy was sunbaked like a fucking tomato and the chopper was running low on gas, so we left that dog in the raft, decided to gas back up and come back later for it. And let me tell you, Chuck, I have to listen to what this guy told me when we got him back to the ship. I'm glad we did it that way. Listen to this. So the guy passed out on the flight back, and back in the med bay on the coast guard cutter, he sits back up like he'd done earlier. Scare me half the shit again and starts asking about that fucking dog. So I tell him we left it out on the life raft and we're planning to head back out to find it. And he says to me, Do not bring that fucking thing back here. So I ask him if he'd been on board this yacht we'd been looking for, the Sunfarer. I think that's the name of the ship. And he says, yeah, it was a deckhand. So I asked him where the ship was. The million dollar question after all. And he just gives me this blank stare. Says he needs time to think, and I was beginning to think he got caught fucking the yacht owner's wife or something, and then killed them or some shit. But I decided to play it cool, so I shrugged and told him it'd be about four hours sail back to Miami, and that he ought to get his story straight before then, seeing that the authorities would likely question the hell out of him on shore. And I told him that he had an easy ear with me if he cared to try and explain, and I think he really wanted to tell somebody. So he lays it on to me over the next four hours. And let me tell you, Chuck, what he said had my fucking neck hairs on end. By this point, a few of the other bargoers had gathered around me and Barnum. The little fucker was spinning what was turning out to be an intriguing little story. And he didn't even notice he was beginning to draw a crowd. I could tell it was only going to get more interesting from there because his cashew fingers were a twirling. And he continued the story, wide-eyed. So the deckhand tells me they'd been about a week out of Rome, headed out for Bimini, and they'd come up on a lifeboat. There's some ship's name that the kid couldn't remember painted on the side, but he said it had an Indian sound to it, and lo and behold, there was nobody inside except this dog, the chocolate lab. So the hedge fund family is thrilled with this dog, like the grandkids are just in love with the thing. Playing fetch with it, and this and that, and they don't really question it, you know? People love dogs, I guess. Well, the whole situation just struck the deckhand as kind of weird, he told me. And he didn't like that dog one bit. He said that the dog had a collar, and then the collar said the dog's name was Tugbo. Now here's where it really gets weird. You ready, Chuck? The yacht's crew quarters were on the very lowest level. I guess the rich bricks saved the money views for themselves. And the night after they found this dog, the deckhand begins to hear a fucking knocking coming from beyond the hole. Like, something out in the sea. He said it kind of sounded like when the yacht was in port and would bob up against the dock, but heavier. Almost like somebody was lightly tapping the outside of the hull with a baseball bat. 
So the kid tries to go about his work over the next few days, but he keeps hearing the same weird shit coming from outside the hall at night. He tells me it got worse each night, up until one night when everyone on the ship is launched out of their fucking beds at like 3 in the morning. They all head out onto the sun deck to see just what the hell was going on, and the captain comes around, tells everyone that the ship's propellers threw a blade, and the resultant vibration messed up the power generator. Tells everyone not to worry and that they've activated the distress beacon and would wait for assistance. Bonham had barely touched his drink. I couldn't believe my goddamn eyes when I saw his nearly full glass, and the whole bar had gone fucking silent as he leaned into the story. Chuck, the Coast Guard never actually picked up that distress beacon, which makes the next part fucking creepier. So the kid tells me he goes back to his quarters to pass the time, and he hears the knocking sound again. He said it sounded like something was trying to gnaw the other prop off. That's what he thought, anyway. But he said the whole shit would rock with each knock. He told me that's when he became really panicked. Kind of like fight or flight caveman shit. And he booked it over to where they keep the emergency life rafts and duffel bags. As he's walking with one back to his room along the outer deck, the ship lurches to one side and gets thrown into the water. The life raft automatically inflated when it hit the seawater. And that's how life rafts work. And the kid pulls himself inside it. Still dazed and coughing, and as he turns to the ship, he watches as the whole fucking yacht was pulled underwater in less than a second, flat. The huge whirlpool the ship made when it went down in the drink sucked the life raft in, and the kid said he blacked out at that point. So this kid wakes up the next morning in the raft, and there's that fucking dog sitting in the raft with him. The only other survivor, bone dry and tail a wagon. So then, Chuck, this kid pauses his story and he looks right fucking at me and asks, in a trembling voice, if I've ever heard of an anglerfish. They're these goblin little fuckers that live only in the darkest, deepest oceans. See, they hunt in a curious manner. They have a long sort of antennae-like thing coming out of their heads. And he has this kind of little glowing ball on the end, and they sit perfectly still in the darkness of the deep ocean, with this little glowing ball stuck way far out in front of them. And they wait. Some unsuspecting little fish comes along and sees the pretty glowing orb come out of total darkness and goes to check it out. And then wham! Little fucker becomes a codfish kebab and the anglerfish gets another meal. Which leads me to the final rub of this story, Chuck. See? Unbeknownst to me at the time, Richie and the rest of the chopper crew had left without me. Back out to find the fucking dog tugboat. The chopper ended up disappearing in a storm. Or so we all heard a few days later. Never did see those boys again. On that Wednesday afternoon, midway through only his fourth drink, Bonham the barfly stood up from his stool nodded sadly and soberly to himself, and walked out of the bar without another word. I went to a yacht party. It'll probably be my last time. By Mr. Outlaw. The fun thing about having rich friends is that you'll probably be able to experience things that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. But there's also a downside. Your rich friends will meet a lot of people. They may also befriend these people and invite them to the same parties they invite you to. Now it's not like I'm antisocial or anything. I'm alright with meeting new people. But not every person you meet will be one you'll want to see again. Some people are just too different personality-wise. Some people are just straight-up dangerous, and sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes, you'll question if they're even a person at all. My friend Jason's dad does... something related to real estate in Florida? He's a big deal over there. So big that Jason could effectively act with impunity regarding funds. But he doesn't. Jason's not a troublemaker, nor is he a complete dick. He studies hard and drives a Toyota Camry. A model son for a rich guy, so to speak. 
Mollison except for one thing. His partying habits. Twice a month, he'll go ballistic, throwing insane parties in hotel suites, renting out luxury Airbnbs for a night, and since we live in Miami, taking out his dad's yacht for a few days. I was invited to his most recent yacht party. At first, he didn't tell us how many people were coming, but he made it sound like there weren't that many. I suppose that 16 isn't quite a lot, but I was still a bit surprised when we showed up. It isn't a tiny yacht by any means, but 16 people put into borderline crowded territory? Plus, I knew that there were only 8 beds. He justified this by saying, 8 beds, 8 girls, you can't fuck this up. Consequently, there were 8 guys as well. Besides Jason, I was only familiar with two others. Mike, one of my closer friends, and Chad, who I kinda knew through various connections but never really talked to for extended periods of time. We left at 4pm on a Friday, planning to dock again on a Sunday morning. Two full nights of partying. If I said that I wasn't excited, that would have been a blatant lie. Right as we were about to leave, one of the girls tried to convince Jason to bring along two of her friends with him. Jason agreed, but probably only because they were hot. And then he told me something concerning. That he only directly knew eight of the people who were coming. The rest were just tagalongs. But again, since most of them were girls, he just decided to allow it. Not the smartest move on his part, but I'm sure he thought that this meant a three-way was in the works for him. In any case, we finally set out. We weren't going very far, and Jason was pretty much an expert in piloting this thing, so I wasn't incredibly worried in that regard. But there were probably 240 beers, 5 bottles of rum, and 12 grams of weed on that boat, which probably meant trouble down the line. I wish we ran into that kind of trouble, as opposed to what actually happened. There were now 18 people, and it was a bit crowded. But that didn't stop it from being a fucking blast. We went deep into the night, and I think I saw some cocaine coming out right before I blacked out. Admittedly, I probably went too hard because my memories after 10pm were pretty fuzzy. I guess I blew my chance at getting laid as well because I was literally in the bathtub when I woke up. I pulled myself up and began scavenging for some cold juice. I noticed that all the bedroom doors were closed and there were only four other people in a similar position to me, still passed out in obscure places. Neither Jason, Mike, nor Chad were amongst them. I finally found some juice and decided to sit on the deck, soaking in the 25 Fahrenheit Miami weather. I noticed a girl lying on a lawn chair across from me, reading a book. I didn't recognize her, but along with the passing out early, I didn't really get acquainted with everybody to begin with, so that was to be expected. I made my way over to the chair beside her and introduced myself. Eric, I said as I shook her hand. Don't think we've met yet. She smiled. Sarah, and no, we haven't. Didn't really have a chance since you died so early last night. Slightly embarrassed, I chuckled back. Yeah, I'll probably tone it down tonight. We sat and talked for a bit before everybody else started waking up, or finishing up their morning routines. After that, we just all hang out, playing pool, darts, taking dips in the ocean, and just having a good time. Somebody pointed out the fact that we couldn't see the shore anymore, even though we definitely couldn't last night. Jason just laughed it off. Don't worry about it. I know what I'm doing. Truth be told, I really wasn't worried about it. We'd gone out farther before, and he'd never had trouble getting us back. Problem is, things got truly concerning once we decided to set up a beer pong tourney. There should have been nine even teams, given that there were 18 of us on the boat. And there were nine teams, plus one extra person. There was no need to recount it or anything. Nineteen people. The anomaly was right there in front of us. Most of us wrote it off as nothing, but Jason looked worried. No, he said. I made a list of everyone who was coming, even Lacey's two friends who got here just before. Should be exactly eighteen. 
There were a few more protests trying to convince him that this meant nothing, but they were sparse. If he took a second to think about it, there was obviously something wrong here. All right, who's the stowaway? Someone called out. Nobody stepped up, of course. I asked Jason if he had everybody's names written down. He said that he did, but couldn't match each name to each face, since most of them were strangers to him. If you snuck onto this yacht, step up. Look, I'm not mad. It's pretty impressive how you did that. I'll let you stay. I just want to know. Nobody still. Well, you had your chance. If I find you now, I'm throwing you off right here. I'm calling out everybody's names. Jason took out the list of people who were supposed to be here and began reading them off. About five in, he calls out a name that nobody answers. I saw him squint down at the paper before letting out an exasperated exhale. This isn't my list. Somebody fucked with my list. I looked and confirmed it for myself. My name wasn't even on it. We had to try something else. What followed next was a painful process of going through each person and trying to figure out who knew who. As expected, it became a messy process trying to narrow down the culprit. Shit escalated when one of the girls let out a scream. You'd think this would indicate a distraction attempt, and that the person who didn't belong had just revealed herself, but she was one of the people that Jason actually knew beforehand, so that wasn't the case. What the fuck, Nikki? Jason said to her. Still looking rattled, she pointed to the water below. There's a person down there! Once she said that, nearly everybody rushed over to take a look. But, there was nobody. We looked for about ten minutes, but nobody ever came up. Nikki stuck to her story, claiming that some dude had been treading in the water, staring up at her. But even if she was telling the truth, what were we supposed to do about it? The option that yielded the most peace of mind was simply writing it off as her eyes playing tricks on her. So... That's what we did. We settled everybody down and went back to the process of elimination. It took a few hours, but we finally managed to come to a conclusion. But it wasn't one that we were expecting. Everybody had been accounted for. Jason counted to make sure. And there were, indeed, 18 people now. Thinking that the stray had ran off when Nikki screamed, Jason told everybody to stay right where they were whilst him and I searched the boat. Eventually we found a dude still sleeping in one of the rooms. This is it, we thought to ourselves. The stray had escaped and was now pretending to sleep. Neither of us recognized him either, so this only put fuel to the fire of suspicion. We woke him up and confronted him. As expected, he defended himself, stating that his friend Lara had invited him. There was only one way to prove whether or not he was bullshitting. We had to ask Lara ourselves. We marched him out onto the deck and asked if anybody knew him. Lara and one of the other girls said yes, putting us right back to where we started. Hold on, Jason told everybody, sounding more frustrated than ever. He walked around and did another body count now including the person who'd been sleeping. Still 18. Did you guys not see anyone walking off? They all shook their heads. You gotta be fucking kidding me! Okay, well, we know that everybody here right now are the ones who are supposed to be here. So stay still whilst I take a picture of everyone's face. Afterwards, we went around and took one more look through the boat. Nobody. We did another head count as well. Eighteen. At the very least, things were momentarily stable. Remembering who didn't belong would have been much easier if we hadn't spent most of our time high and inebriated. Also, if half the girls here didn't look the same... Jason had the type, after all. By this point, it was around 6pm, and with everything that had happened, nobody was really in the partying mood. By the time 9pm had rolled around, more than half of us had just decided to sleep. The ones who remained, including Jason and I, cracked open a few beers to calm our nerves. We put on some low-volume music and started playing cards. 
As it started getting dark, I decided to go over to the front of the boat in order to grab a picture of the sunset. As I was trying to get my phone camera to focus, I heard a thump coming from below me. I looked down and nearly fainted. One of those smaller, two-person fishing boats was bumping against the front of the yard. Nobody inside. I told everybody what I had seen, but they had no idea how to react to the news. It all seemed to add up. The extra person in our group, the man in the water, and now the boat. But once you start factoring in the weird-ass details, it starts making less sense. Now on high alert, we decided to just watch a movie on Jason's laptop. There was obviously an obscure tension in the air, but we opted to ignore it. We were going home soon. At this point, it was completely dark outside, and besides the moon, our only source of illumination were the deck lights. Eventually, somebody got up in order to use the washroom. I didn't see who it was. They seemed to finish up rather quickly, returning only a few minutes later and sitting down beside me. And then, a few more minutes after that, Another person came onto the deck. Guys? Who the hell is that? It wasn't the person beside me who asked. It was the person who had just arrived. The question made my heart drop. Nobody moved and I didn't dare to look at whatever was sitting beside me. If they were a real human being, they would have just spoken up. I could hear it breathing with this weird staccato rhythm of exhales that made my skin crawl. They sat there, deathly still for what felt like hours, and then the thing beside me started cackling like some fucking demon from another dimension. It was high-pitched and rapid, almost like a chittering of some kind. The cackling quickly devolved into what sounded like gurgling, and that's when I broke. I flipped shit and started running. So did everybody else. I began trying to barge into every room, but they were all locked. I ended up just locking myself in a bathroom. Probably a selfish decision, but I was in self-preservation mode. I could hear them still running around outside, screaming and banging on the doors. The worst thing about this was the fact that we didn't even know what the hell we were running from. I stayed put until things began settling down. Until the scattered screams and rapid footsteps had ceased. I checked my phone. 3.11 a.m. If it was now calm out there, then that meant one of two things. Either everybody found a hiding spot, or, well, you know. Eventually, sleep got the better of me. I remember waking up to somebody banging on the bathroom door. I was startled at first, but then I heard Jason's voice. Whoever's in there, we're fucking leaving! I checked the time on my phone. 7.35am. I opened the door and stumbled out, realizing that we'd docked. We were back on land. Jason was pacing around, still knocking on every door and telling everybody to come out. Apparently, he had locked himself in the cockpit during the confusion and brought us back during the night. We ended up doing another head count. Still 18. After a brief sigh of relief, we all got the hell off the boat, nobody taking a second glance. As I walked with Jason towards his car, we didn't say a single word. Even while he was driving me back to my house, we remained silent. But as we pulled up into my driveway and I was about to lock myself in my room forever, he stopped me. I memorized everybody's face last night. Even though I counted 18, I only recognized 16 of them. It took my brain a second to process what this meant, but even when it did, I still found it hard to respond. I don't know what to do. That was the last thing that he said to me before driving off. Fuck the ocean. <laughs>